This is Asadreem Khan with Nevertheless. We're going to be talking about an issue that has been with Pakistan for a very long time, a land and land reform. Now, why this is such a big problem is because Pakistan is, as everyone knows, an agricultural economy. But when the vast majority of its rural households don't own any land, and there's study after study that has linked landlessness to poverty, we can start to understand the scale of the issue. There's also the many benefits that land reform has brought to the region in general. Uh, one amazing place to start is Studwell's book, How Asia Works, in which after studying China, Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, the result is quite clear. The core component in the Asian miracle common to all countries was land reform as a primary step and the benefits are really wide ranging. Uh, first, it uh, maximizes agricultural output, it minimizes key inequalities, it creates jobs and it redistributes wealth. Uh, what did Pakistan do? Uh, just the uh, opposite. So in the first decade of its life, we saw land reform uh, throttled by the Muslim League leadership, which was disproportionately uh, from a land holding uh, backgrounds. Uh, then, when Field Marshal Ayub Khan took over and imposed martial law, the legislation that did come in by way of land reform was incredibly inadequate. Uh, land ceilings were much too high and government will was half-hearted at best. Uh, finally, when there were two different rounds of land reform uh, policies by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, we again saw some of the same issues with the Ayub Khan era, the land ceilings were much too high, uh, but also the trouble with misallocation. Uh, unscrupulous individuals would try and circumvent the law. They would misallocate land to their relatives or their staff. And per one paper, if the Ayub era and Bhutto era reforms were to be taken together, it would benefit only 0.02% of rural households that were eligible for such reforms. So. Uh, not only was the existing um, efforts at uh, land reform inadequate, the death knell finally came in 1990 when the Kizil Bash Vakf judgment was issued by the Shariat Appellate Bench of the Supreme Court. Now, this is an opinion by Mufti Taki Usmani, who, in addition to being a religious scholar, also authored a hypercapitalist interpretation of Islamic thought. According to uh, Mufti Taki Uswani, to impose any land ceiling on the private acquisition of property would be un-Islamic. And yet there's a very clear dissenting opinion by Justice Naseem Hassan Shah, which says that the individual's freedom to acquire land must of course be weighed against corresponding uh, interests like social justice, like social equity, like the greater good. And he also grounds it in Islamic provisions himself. But the corrosive effects of the Kizilbash judgment have only grown as time has passed. We now have an entire agricultural economy that is exempt from taxation. We have the same landed gentry that has a stranglehold on parliament uh, and their unelected backers continue to perpetuate them. And any effort at land reform is killed right in the beginning. And this is doubly strange considering the conversation around land reform has been so rich and um, so profound uh, right from the start. In fact, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, Pakistan's greatest poet, actually went as far as saying the future of Islam in India is directly linked to the emancipation of the peasantry of Punjab. Uh, many noted scholars, Dr. Parvez Tahir, have also written how Iqbal's writings are in consonance with land redistribution, how uh, land is not the direct result of private labor, but actually a gift of common nature uh, per Iqbal. So considering these conversations have been happening for so long, Pakistan at the state level tried its level best uh, to uh, not uh, go any further on the subject. So what can be done right now? Uh, for starters, there's a review petition by a senior counsel, Abed Hassan Minto, which is still pending in the Supreme Court 
and seeks to reverse uh, the consequences of the Kizilbash Vakf judgment. It is now for the state to try and support the review petition as much as it can and then subsequently table legislation which learns from the uh, inadequacies of the Ayub era and Bhutto era land reforms. That means land ceilings that are much lower. Uh, it also means empowering the federal and provincial land commissions and uh, there has to be some inbuilt mechanism uh, to guard against misallocation uh, to uh, relatives or uh, staff such as uh, family ceilings um, and other such uh, tweaks that can really uh, easily be done. Now, there is criticism, usually from the landed gentry, that says that, oh, these land holdings are being broken down on a, uh, in a natural sort of way and they should be uh, left alone. Uh, but that is also a way of saying, we're going to distribute this amongst our kids, their kids' kids are going to distribute it amongst themselves, it'll get smaller and smaller as long as you wait. People didn't wait in China or in Taiwan or in South Korea or in Japan. They didn't wait in India or Bangladesh either. In fact, Bangladesh had much lower land ceilings than we did. The results are again before us and it is something we did not learn from even when there was a West Pakistan and an East Pakistan. Uh, to conclude, there was a very famous radical from a neighboring country that said revolution is not a dinner party. Uh, keeping such views in mind, land reform remains the most moderate solution and it is also the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So this was nevertheless with Asad Reem Khan. Uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you.